Hi there, my name is Rob Canzanieri, and I'm with the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. And um, on the screen here is my contact information if you want to uh, email me or go to my blog. Today we have Jess on, on giving a webinar today on minimum data loss. And I was, I had the fortune, I was very lucky to go see her at PASS, and I asked her to come online today, and she said she made some time. Thank you, Jess. And I was just going to give this presentation that I got to see at PASS. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Yes. So um, PASS has a lot of virtual chapters, and I'll bring this slide up to, sh to show you all the virtual chapters. And if there's anything you'd like to uh, more information on, you can go to SQL pass.org slash bc and sign up for um, all these chapters and uh, you'll be able to see their webinars like this one and uh, finally uh, there's some upcoming SQL Saturdays that I wanted to point out one in particular in Boston because Jess is going to be at Boston so if you um, want to see her uh, she's presenting right is for Jess, I you're, am yeah. I will be I will be arriving on that Thursday to give a full day pre-con and then I'll be there all day Saturday and I'll be presenting so if you happen to be in the area or considering coming would like to meet me in person ask more questions please do so uh, a few logistics here um, the session is recorded I'm recording it right now um, and um, hold your questions um, to the end and if you can email me or Jess um, we will take the questions offline because this is a very long uh, presentation. Jess has condensed it down, I believe, from about uh, 75 minutes to 60 minutes. So all questions, uh, if you hold off on them and just email me or email Jess, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll somehow get them to Jess and we'll get some answers for you guys. So with that, I want to thank Jess for coming today and I'm going to change it over to her. So uh, here we go changing it right now okay you should be able to see I can see your screen right okay I'm gonna mute out for now and if you need anything uh, I'll come back online all right sounds great thanks Rob so as I said good morning or afternoon or I even see a couple people I know from Europe so good evening uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day to join me virtually and get some training on SQL Server. I'm here today to help you minimize data loss through advanced restore methods. Um, quick introduction, my name is Jess Borland. I'm a senior SQL engineer at Concurrency, a Microsoft MVP and Microsoft MCP. I'm based out of Wisconsin, a couple hours north of Chicago. Currently a consultant and in my previous life I was a DBA. So each of these situations that I'm going to be talking about today, I've run into them. I've had these things happen to me. I want you to know that they can happen to you, they might happen to you, and I want you to be prepared for them ahead of time. The things that I'm going to be talking about specifically, using point in time restores to get to a specific point or transaction, restoring one or more pages of a database, and a really cool, uh, but unfortunately enterprise edition only feature called piecemeal restores. And yes, the slides and demos are available from my blog, blogs.lessthan.com slash question mark P equals 4319, and this will be at the end again as well. So, Think back on your career working with data. Have you ever had the unfortunate situation where you have lost data? I'm sure that most DBAs and even some developers are probably nodding their heads thinking, oh yes, there was this one time or just last week, that time, that time we didn't have a backup for our server. It happens. As good DBAs, as good data professionals, we want to be able to mitigate that risk as best as possible. Because many times these days, uh, you know, a business's data is not just important to the business, oftentimes it is the business. So how do we prevent data loss or have minimal data loss? We need to have backups of our data. Number one thing that you need to be familiar with is the backup database command. 
and the backup log command. More importantly than that, though, we have to have the correct schedule of backups. If the business says that we need to be able to restore to any point within the last hour, you better make sure you're taking regular transaction log backups at least every hour, perhaps more frequently. And most importantly, we need to be able to test that our backups are valid by restoring them. So hopefully you have a process in place to you know, regularly restore your backups to a secondary location. Maybe you're doing something like log shipping. Maybe you have a monthly test to pull some random backups and restore them. Perhaps you have a scheduled system where you take your production backup and restore it to QA for usage once a week. That counts. We're just making sure that our backups are valid. But unfortunately, even when we do these things, we can still face data loss. And data loss comes from a couple of different things. Um, it could be system error, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some sort of corruption on disk causing us to lose data. Uh, but more frequently, it's through user error. Uh, we have people that run a delete without a where clause or run an update and update all of the records in the table rather than just the few that they wanted to. I know, I've done this before myself. And sometimes it's an all-out failure where we lose our main server or our main data center and we're facing recovering data in terms of disaster recovery situations. Hopefully each of these methods that I'll talk about will help you out in any one of those situations. So the first one that I want to talk about is recovering to a specific point in time with the emphasis on the fact that anything after that point in time is lost. So right now for me it's 12.08 p.m. on February 24th. Say that I wanted to restore to, uh, say that I have a database in full recovery model. I want to restore to um, and I'm taking log backups every 15 minutes. If I wanted to restore to 11.30 a.m. today, I could, but I would lose anything that's been entered since that, so 38 minutes worth of data. That might be acceptable. Sometimes it is, particularly if it's one of those user error sort of things. We have a few options for being able to do this. First caveat, yeah, we have to have our database in the full or the bulk logged recovery mode. Um, we can't do this with simple databases that just have the full backups. Because what we do is we use our log backups and we issue a command in there. One of these options I'm showing, stop at, stop at mark, or stop before mark to get to the specific point that we want to be at. Uh, the stop at allows us to enter a specific date and time. We can be as generic as a minute and as specific as a millisecond. Stop at mark and stop before mark uh, are something we work with in transactions to be able to recover to a specific transaction or even a log sequence number, or LSN. Uh, the stop at command being one of my favorites is, um, I learned this when I was a junior DBA. Someone wanted to restore their database to, I believe it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I said the last, you know, we have backups to 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock. If I restore it to 4 o'clock, it's going to you know, overrate your data. So I ended up negotiating down with them to restore it to 12 o'clock. And in my team's weekly meeting, I went over that. And one of the senior DBAs said, well, Jess, why didn't you just use the stop at command? And I looked at him and I said, shut the front door. What? Turns out you could I could have taken that 4 p.m. backup and specified 2 p.m. Didn't know that then, but I know it now. So why would we use stop at, stop at mark? Um, oftentimes I'll use those for those user mistakes where perhaps we had an oops, insert or delete or update and we don't mind losing everything after it. Um, another valid option is perhaps we roll out some code, um, story procedure changes, et cetera. Something was incorrect and we need to roll back every change that happened since then and take the bad code out. One thing that these tools won't do is help you with object level recovery. Um, unfortunately, SQL Server natively still does not have the option to say, you know, I just need to pull table, um, you know, people that person 
out of the database. There are some third-party tools that can do that for you. So the best way to show this to you is to demo it. Most of this session is demos, which is why I've made the demos available um, on my blog. So when I talk about using the point in time restores and starting with that stop at command. So I'm going to be using my organize my Lego sample database to uh, show that off. Here I have several tables that have different sizes of Lego pieces that I keep track of. Let's see what the original state of this large table is. You can see that I have four items in there right now. Let's pretend that we are handling regular transactions. I'm going to update the table. I want to set ID number equal to two, uh, quantity zero. When I do that, I'm just going to grab this current date timestamp so I know when I'm referencing it back to. You can see now I still have four items, but quantity has changed on one. All right. Next thing I'm going to do, issue a delete command where the ID is equal to one. That's going to remove one record. Let me grab that. You can see it indeed did. We are now down to three records instead of four. Put that date and time in. Now let's say I kind of sort of forgot to uncomment my where clause. I issue my delete command. And, oops, we don't have any records left. That's a user mistake. You know what? We're all human. Those happen. What we need to be able to do is say, okay, we know roughly when this happened, or the user knows roughly when this happened, so let's go ahead and be able to get back to it. Again, this requires regular full in log backups, so I'm going to take a new log backup. Uh, then, normally in order to do this, I would, you know, restore the database to, uh, you know, a different server under the same name or to the same server under a different name. I'm just going to write over it for the purposes of this demo. This is typically not what you would do. What I really want to show you is this command here. After doing my database, restore database from disk, I would, so if I'd had multiple log backups, say, Say I took the full backup at 6 a.m. and I had hourly log backup 7, 8, 9, 10. And then I would take the 11 o'clock backup and I would say, okay, I want to restore to this point in time. So here I'm going to say that I want to restore to right before this delete happened. I'm going to grab my time, 224 at 12, 12, 57. And you'll notice that my restore log command has a stop at option in it. And I can say restore log from disk with no recovery and stop at. That no recovery to me is always really important. It makes sure that the database stays in this restoring state until I know for sure that every backup that I want uh, applied to it is there. Then I can say restore database with recovery. People can connect to it and issue transactions. So the database is available. Now, what does that large table look like? Remember, we started out with four records. Then we set one of the records to have zero quantity. Then we deleted one of the items, so we were down to three, and then we deleted all of them. Hopefully, we should be where we have three items left. And we have actually rolled back to even before I issued that delete. So that, let's see, I picked 12, 12, 57. Yep, that was even before I selected the delete. So that is how the restore with stop at works. It allows us to reference a very specific point in time. Again, useful primarily for uh, recovering from user oops. Now, that's just the first of those point in time options. The other two that I showed you were stop at mark and stop before mark. These are used in conjunction with what we call marked transactions. 
March transactions aren't used a lot, but I think they could be. I think they're kind of an under, uh, underutilized feature of SQL Server, so to say. They're especially useful for uh, particularly like single tenant databases. Um, you know, software as a service vendors have them frequently. Um, Microsoft SharePoint and what's the other one? Um, I know that SharePoint uses them, as do some of the other Microsoft programs. Essentially, you have multiple databases, and they share some information, and they share a code base. And you may want to be able to, say, roll out a stored procedure to all of the databases, put that in a marked transaction, and then have users continue to start to add transactions. But if something went wrong there, how can you get all of those databases back to the point before that happened? There's no guarantee that all of the transactions happened at the same time in each of the databases. This is where marked transactions can come in handy. So I'm going to be showing you this with a two database example, client A and client B. They have a shared products table. So the products table contains the same columns and the same data, and we want to keep those synced. And then they each have their own orders table. If we were to look at this right now, I would see that Client A has three products and Client B has three products. Client A has three orders and Client B has three orders, but note that those are for different clients, different products, and different quantities. Now what I'm going to do is issue a marked transaction. I want to update my product's price. So I'm going to say update the price, increase it by 10%. I wrap this in a transaction. The uh, So here I say begin transaction, update product prices. This is the transaction name, update product prices, and that's what we're going to be concerned about. So when we say uh, stop at mark or stop before mark, we're going to use this transaction name. We also need to use this command with mark. We can add a description. This is optional. It can have a variable passed in. I've been asked that once upon a time. Let's see how this works. I declare, I begin my transaction with my mark. I update it and I commit it. All right, three rows affected in each database, as it should be. Now what I'm going to do is insert an additional order into client B and insert an additional order into client A. I've taken full backups. As normal, I would have regular transaction log backups be taken as well. And now to show you how a uh, stop before mark would work, what I'm going to do is say, okay, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have increased the prices by 10%. They were only supposed to go up by 8%. Unfortunately, not only is the products table incorrect, but any orders placed after that are also incorrect. Mm -hmm. So I want to issue this command, restore database client A from disk with replace and no recovery. And then I want to issue the restore log, again, with no recovery. And I issue this command stop before mark using the marked transaction name. Run that. I'm going to run the same thing for client B. Restore the database from the full backup, then restore the log with no recovery and the stop before mark option. Okay, that's been restored. Now, let's look at this. Remember, the updates I had done, I had increased the prices. That should be rolled back and I had added an additional order to each of those. That should be rolled back, and each client should only have three. And there we go. It's consistent across each of the databases. Notice the prices are not 1.1, 2.2, and 3.3. Rather, they are the whole numbers again, and that additional order has been removed from each. 
The beautiful thing about this is it allows us to have that transactional consistency across multiple databases. Uh, a few notes then. I showed you both the stop at mark and stop before mark option. Stop, I, or I should say I demoed stop before mark, but there's another option, stop at mark. If I used stop at mark, what would have happened there is anything that happened in that marked transaction would have, would have stayed. So the prices would have remained at that 1.1, 2.2, etc. Anything after it would have been undone. So make a note of the difference and test the differences between the two if you ever need to use this option. Another option, rather than using a named transaction, if you need to roll back to a specific LSN, you can use something like FNDB log to find the specific uh, LSN. You can pass that in instead. Uh, for the purposes of time, I won't be demoing that today. And if you ever need to know, are we using marked transactions? Which one do I grab? You can query the MSDB log mark history table that will give you an idea of the marked transactions that have been run in any given database. You can run the same uh, mark multiple times in a database. It's going to be unique via LSN. If I had multiple update product prices listed in here and I rolled back and I said stop before mark update product prices, SQL Server would go back to the most recent. If I wanted to go back to a uh, farther in time one, perhaps I wanted to roll back to last week's price change, I would have to specify an LSN instead of a mark. So that is the stop, uh, that is the point in time restores. I hope those will be useful to you someday. Again, primarily used for uh, user errors in terms of inserts, updates, deletes, um, and we made changes to code that we didn't need to. Another situation that you may face in your database administration is corruption. Normally this is the point where I say, everyone in the room that's encountered corruption, raise your hands, good, everyone else, you're going to. Because it happens. Data gets corrupted all the time. We need to be able to handle it. Here's the thing though, how do we recover from corruption? Now you might think, well, I'll just run a DBCC check DB. Well, that's going to find the corruption. So you think, okay, DBCC check DB with repair allow data loss. Hold your horses. Whoa, it says right in the command, allow data loss. Don't get so anxious to do that. Another option would be, well, I'm going to take a full backup and just restore it. The last good full backup. Okay, but what if the backup is a terabyte in size? What if you have two damaged pages and a backup that's a terabyte in size? You may be able to save yourself some time by restoring individual pages rather than the whole database. So the page restore works on identifying one or more of those 8K data pages in SQL Server and restoring them. Let me show you how that's done. I have this excitingly named database called Corrupt Me. Yeah, it's just begging for it. You'll notice it's simply a copy of AdventureWorks. I love AdventureWorks. I'm going to do a few things to make sure that my page restore is working. I'm going to make sure it's in the full recovery model. I'm going to check my SQL backups folder to make sure I don't have the corrupt me full already and run into problems. I'm going to back up my database. Foundation of any restore process. To show you this, I'm going to be using the purchasing.ship method table which has both a clustered and a non-clustered index and showing you some execution plans. So I select all of my rows from this table I notice I have five options. One is XRQ truck. Notice that to get the data, I'm doing a clustered index scan. As any good DBA would do, I am taking regular transaction log backups. 
I'm going to update my table. I set the name equal to the Jack Jack Express. For those of you that know me, perhaps follow me on Twitter, you've probably been introduced to my very, very energetic, excitable dog, Jack Jack. He could run his own trucking company. He'd be more than happy to run around the country. I issue a checkpoint to make sure that gets flush to disk, and then I get into the really fun stuff. I'm going to show you how to corrupt and fix a clustered index. So the first, so this database doesn't have any corruption. I could verify that by running a DBCC check DB with no info messages. As a matter of fact, let's do that just so you know I'm not pulling a rabbit out of the hat here. This is indeed correct. There, commands completed successfully, no corruption. How am I going to show you? I'm going to corrupt it. I'm going to find an 8K page in SQL Server, go open it in a hex editor, and I'm going to cause corruption. This is cool. I'm going to use the sys.dmdb database page allocations function. I'm going to pass in a database name, an object name, table name, and then an index ID, in this case one, to get the clustered index number to find the data pages. This is a small one. There were only five records, remember, and they were, it was only six columns wide. So the page ID I'm going to be working with is 820. If you want to do this demo later and you're using something before SQL Server 2012, you have to use DBCC IND instead of this function. All right, to do the corruption, let's crack our fingers a little bit here. Let's get ready to take the database offline. We won't be able to corrupt it while it's still being used. Now, what I need to do is open a hex editor and find the page. Uh, the hex editor is going to ask me for the page offset. Offset being the number of bytes from the beginning of the file to the beginning of the page. Um, so I take that page ID 820 and I multiply it by the number of bytes, so 8192, and this is the number I come up with. Now, let's go to a file I should have had open already, but I didn't. I'm going to be using a hex editor called xvi32.exe. It's an open source uh, free hex editor I found on the internet. Right click and run as administrator. Doesn't look like much right now because we don't have a file open, but I can solve that. I'm going to find my data folder and open corruptmedata.mdf. Here we go. This is my database. This is my data. If you look, you can see right there, it says AdventureWorks 2014 underscore data. If I find that page by going to address go to and entering that page number, right here is my data. Oh, look, there is the Jack Jack Express. There is Overseas Deluxe. You know what this tells me? If someone can get their hands on a copy of your MDF, they can open it up in a hex editor and they can see your data. This is one of many reasons we use things like transparent data encryption. If it's sensitive, secure data, encrypt it, because there's a chance this could happen. All right, now let's corrupt our data. How do we do it? I'm just going to change something. I'm going to change one of the letters. Um, when SQL Server goes to read the data on that page, it's going to look at the checksum at the top and to see what it expects to find. It's going to recalculate the checksum and it's going to realize the two aren't the same. So I save my change, close the hex editor, come back to Management Studio. I'm going to bring my database online. Will it work? Sure. There is nothing about bringing a database online that checks for corruption. What if I try to view the data? Remember, I. Uh, I'm going to try viewing the person.person .person table. That works, no problem. SQL Server is not looking for corruption actively on that page. What if I try to select the names from purchasing.ship method? That works just fine. And that still says Jack Jack Express. But what if I do a select star? Uh oh. SQL Server detects detected a logical consistency-based I.O. error incorrect checksum. That's SQL Server telling you you have corruption. Note that 
it's message 824. That's the error number it's throwing. If you had an alert, SQL Server agent alerts for error 824, and I went to history, I would notice that this was fired right away. This is an important reason to have alerts for errors 823, 824, and 825 set up on your system. Be forewarned when corruption occurs, not after people are uh, coming and burning your desk down. Now, why did it occur on select star but not the select name? Let's go back here and look at that execution plan. Uh, using select name, it used the non-clustered index on the table. Um, so depending on how many indexes you have, what type of queries you're running, you might not see corruption right away. So ways to check if we do have corruption. Uh, after a page has been read, you can check the MSDB table suspect pages. This will tell me that my database ID 11, page ID 820, had an error. We could review the SQL Server error log. We would see that error 824 logged there. And we can run our DBCC check DB, which because it does find corruption, you should be running that on a regular basis. Now, this was always my problem as a junior DBA. I run DBCC check DB every week. Nothing ever finds corruption. What is it going to look like? How will I know? This is exactly what it looks like. It's going to give you this information. Um, there's a table error. Here's the object ID. So that's the table ID in the system objects table, index ID, allocation unit IDs. It's giving you all of the information you need to solve the problem. Right here, it's even telling us specifically, hold on, not what I wanted to do is zoom in. There we go. It's telling us specifically page ID 1.820. So let me zoom in again and get that for you. This is where when I encounter corruption, I want to, before just rushing off to restore the entire database, before just rushing off to run a check DB with allow repair data loss, I want to take a step back and think about the situation. What is this object? What is the table? Is it a clustered or a non-clustered index? Do a little bit of research. Check your sys.objects table, your sys.indexes table. If it's a non-clustered index, guess what? Fixing corruption is really easy. Rebuild the index. If it's a clustered index, it's going to be a little bit more work, and I'll show you what I'm going to do here. If it is a clustered index and you have recent full and log backups, which you should do because you're a good DBA and you have those things for your systems, you can assess how many pages. Is it the entire table? Is it thousands of pages? Or is it just a couple that were affected? In this case, because it's one page, I'm going to do a page restore rather than restoring the entire database. Here's how I go about that. I would first take the object ID that I would found in the DBCC CheckDB output, run this query to figure out what table is it, you know, what index is it? Okay, my ship method table, it was my PK index. So what I need to do is do an offline page restore. So there are two different options with page restores. If you have SQL Server Enterprise Edition, you can do an online page restore. That means the majority of the database stays online. The object you're restoring will be offline. Uh, in all other editions of SQL Server, you can do an offline page restore. So you take your database offline, restore the necessary pages, and then bring it back online. Um, I'm going to show you the offline syntax because offline will work in every single version of SQL Server. Uh, the online is completely different syntax. It's very confusing. I stick to one. I have written blogs in the past if you just Google Jess Borland you know, online page restore, you can see my um, information where I've done that. So here's what we do. We, in this case, because my database is still here and it's in a, um, 
online state. To take it offline, I'm actually going to do a tail of the log backup. So I'm going to say backup log to disk with no recovery. That captures what transactions can be captured and puts the database in the restoring state. Now I want to issue a restore database command. Note that in between the restore database and the from disk command, I have this new little option, page equal to. There is my page 1 colon 820, straight off the DBCC check DB output. If I had multiple, I would separate them with commas. So I restore my database, a specific page or pages from disk with no recovery. Remember, we need to apply log backups after that. Database, still in restoring mode. Now I have to restore my log backups. You'll notice I'm not seeing anything differently here. So my log backups aren't going to be looking at a specific page. If there were any transactions that affected that particular object, they would either be rolled back or rolled forward as needed. I don't have to specify pages when I specify the log backups. All right, so database is in restoring state. I know that I have restored all of my log backups that I want to restore, so I say restore with recovery. The important thing now is, is it fixed? Let's issue that command that did not work earlier. The select star, it's back. I can get all of my rows, and it says jack jack, not something else. If I look at my execution plan, I see that we are again running a clustered index scan. So there we go. Rather than having to restore the entire database, I was able to isolate the page that had the corruption and restore just that one. I can double check by running a check DB. Wait for it, and there we go. Command completed successfully. No bad data. So good question here that I always like to ask the audience. What if you don't have a recent full backup? You just have, what if you took a full backup a month ago and you have log backups every hour since then? You're going to be doing a lot of log restores. Make sure you have regular, full, perhaps differential, and log backups. What if you didn't have full and log backups? What if you're not taking regular backups on your database and you encounter corruption? Things get very difficult very fast. Again, this goes back to my first point. Regular backups on the right schedule are incredibly important. I can't stress that enough. And again, if it was a non-clustered index, what would we do? We would find the page. Through DBCC check DB. And I would rebuild the index. So there we go. That is how we do a page restore. Again, I hope that you don't have to encounter a lot of corruption in a production database anytime soon. But inevitably, every DBA I know has run into it at some point in their career. The best thing that you can do for yourself is to download that hex editor, get a sample database, open it up, corrupt it, and then go back in and fix it. Knowing how to fix corruption and being familiar with the process, maybe even having a script right at your fingertips in your script library that shows you the commands to run is going to help you keep cool, calm, and collected when it does happen, when inevitably there's a business user or a manager you know, calling you, emailing you, standing over your desk saying, listen, the business is losing money, you know, throwing $100 bills on the floor like, hey, we're just burning these right now. Um, be aware of how to find data corruption and how to fix it. One of the most important skills you can achieve. All right, so with that, let's go on to our last uh, option, which is what do you have when? You have, you can achieve your RPO, right? So the business says we need to make sure that we can restore to any point within the last hour. You're like, okay, so I'm gonna take a full backup every day. I'm going to take differential backups every six hours, and then after that, I'm going to take log backups every 15 minutes. Restore granularity should be 15 minutes. But then on the RTO side, the business says, if there is a full disaster, I want to be able to bring this database back up 
in under an hour. I can't be without this application for that long. It's business critical. No big deal if the database is 20 gig in size. Probably not even a big deal if it's 200 gig in size. What do you do with very large databases, though? What if you have a two terabyte database and due to disk constraints, network constraints, um, what if it takes two hours to do a full database restore? How can you shorten that RTO? Well, there are several options, one of them being a piecemeal restore. Typically, I only do use this on very large databases where you can't meet the specified RTO. What the piecemeal restore allows you to do is bring certain parts of the database, certain files online before others. That means that you have to have your database architected out into separate file groups and separate files. So this requires very careful planning. You need to know which objects are tied to which file groups so you know which ones to bring online first. That can be really useful if you have you know, a ton of tables or even partitions that have old data and archive data that you don't need to bring online. You just want to get you know, your orders table, your customers table, your suppliers tables, um, you know, the last month worth of trades, the most important, you know, last three years worth of doctor's appointments up first and worry about the rest of it later. Um, one other note, this is an enterprise edition only feature. You can do it in standard, but the whole database this is offline, so I don't see any point in really using it for this. Um, again, we do this to hopefully meet our RTO goals, and the easiest way to show you is to show you. I am going to be using my Organize My Lego database again for the purposes of this demo. The reason for that being it already has multiple files and multiple file groups. You saw that when I did my earlier restore, but just to review, here are my file groups, primary. Every SQL Server database has at least one file group, and it's called primary. All of your system objects are on it. And then I have large, medium, small, and archive. I can see which tables reside on which file groups, or which objects technically. Um, this is helpful, again, if you're considering doing this for a large database, you need to say, okay, this is the file group I bring online first, this is what I bring on second, third, fourth, 97th. Uh, use a query like this to be able to identify what needs to be brought online first. Another requirement, the database must be in the full recovery model. One thing I'm going to do is make one of my uh, file groups read only, so you can see the difference between read re between restoring read write and read only. I'm going to start taking my full backups. I'm going to insert into my large Lego table. I'm going to be a good DBA and take a regular transaction log backup. I'm going to insert into my medium table. And in this case, I'm going to back up my log again. In this case, I'm also going to do a no truncate. I'm just going to cheat a little bit and cause a disaster and take my database offline. Oops, we lost our database. There is no more organize my Lego. I have to recover from this. Not to fear. We can do just that. Um, let's go and look at how we do that. There we go. Get to the right place in your script, Jess. All right. Uh, in some Microsoft documentation, they call it a partial restore sequence, and in some they call it a piecemeal restore. If you ever hear those terms, that's what they mean. A couple of notes about the first restore that you do. Uh, the first restore has to include the primary file group. The first restore also has to include the with partial option. So this is what it looks like. Restore database, specify at least one file group, and that has to be the primary in the first one. 
pick your full back up, say with partial and no recovery. Then restore the resulting log files. Now at this point, organize my light I was still in the restoring state. Now I say restore database with recovery. The database is going to show that it is in, not in a restoring state. Typically at this point, typically if you would try to restore anything else, you would get errors about how the database can't be rolled forward, can't be rolled back, not in a transactionally consistent state. But applying this with partial command, tell SQL Server, we're going to be applying more backups. The database files, what state are they in? Only those that were on the primary file group are online. My large, medium, small, and archive are still in recovery pending. If I try to select from a table on one of those file groups, I get an error. I'm able to produce a plan. It tells me why it's in a file group that is not online. So what we want to do now is Hopefully, if you're in this situation, again, you've sat down with your business users. You've defined what parts of the application are most important and what objects in the database tie to that, and you know which file groups to bring online at a time. I'm going to start with my large LEGO file group. Restore database, file group equal to, and then from disk, and I specify my log backups after that. Note that only the first restore database command needed that with partial. I don't have the with partial here. If I try to select from that large table, I can select now. That's online. I can view my results, but the rest of the database is not. I may even be able to insert into it. No cannot be modified. One or more non-clustered indexes reside in a file group which is not online. Again, when architecting your database and the multiple files and file groups for a situation like this, make sure that all of the objects you need for your uh, initial objects, initial file groups are either in the same file group or you're restoring multiple file groups at a time. Try to get from the medium, I get that same error message, table resides in a file group that is not online. Okay, part of my database is online, part of my application is online. Users can be doing work right now. So again, if you're in the case where you have this massive database, then it's that 80-20 rule, right? 20% of the data does 80% of the work. Get that 20% online, let 80% of the people do their work. Bring the rest of it, the older data, the less active data online later. In this case, my medium Lego. I'm going to issue another restore database command. I'm going to specify the medium Lego file group. Full backup, log backup, log backup, restore database. One thing to note, I could specify multiple file groups here. So I could say small Lego, I would just need to uh, separate them with a comma. I like to bring them online one at a time to show you what different options look like. For example, um, inserting into that large table works now. The non-clustered index resides on the medium file group. I can select from the medium table. I try to insert into the medium table. That works. Uh, last one that should be unavailable is the Lego sold table. I believe that's on the archive file group. File group is not online. All right, so, so far I have restored my primary file group, my large file group, and my medium file group. The two left are small and archive only. Remember, I have made the archive only a read-only file group. You know, that's pretty common in very large databases. You, you want older data to be you know, read-only. You don't need to take care of it for all of your maintenance operations. Those types of file groups are much easier to restore in a file group sequence as well because all you need to specify is that full backup and then your restore database command. If the 
file group was in the read-only state before you took the full backup, obviously it's been read-only. No changes have been able to make. Transaction logs just aren't affected. Uh, that's a good reason to take a look at your very large databases. Take a look at you know older uh, data that you have, older partitions, archive databases, etc. And be able to mark those read-only. So you can have the benefit of doing fewer operations like this. Now I can select data from that table. Last but not least, I'll go through and I'll check the file state. Note I brought everything except the small Lego online, but what I need to be done can be done. So that is, in a nutshell, about as fast as I can make it happen, a piecemeal restore. I have used these particularly in terms of you know, initializing a very large, uh, what, we, what we used as a data warehouse, but it was really just a copy of our OLTP that was scripted out to have a few different indexes added. Um, and it does help to be able to bring part of the database online rather than waiting for the whole thing. But before you rush off to do a piecemeal restore, again, take a step back. It's kind of like with the page restore option where I said when you encounter corruption, don't just rush off to do this or rush off to do that. Think about it, step back a little bit. Um, one option to be able to meet RTO is doing a piecemeal restore. But could you do something like keeping a warm standby um, either on another server in the same data center or even in your DR center, possibly even in Azure, through something like an always-on availability group with an asynchronous uh, secondary um, database mirroring, even the old standby log shipping. You know, uh, really sit down and look at your very large databases and determine what are the RPO and RTO goals. Uh, does it make sense to have a warm standby you know, what does that do for hardware costs, licensing costs, how much storage do you have, how frequently do you need the data? Lots of things to consider. Again, piecemeal restore is not the only option, but it is one and can be one very useful option for sure. All right, so what I, what I hope I have taught you in the last hour the first step for anyone dealing with data is to make sure that the important data, which is all of the data, is backed up. You need to be taking the right backups, full backups, perhaps differential backups, log backups. You need to be taking them on the right schedule. Can't just take a log backup every hour because that's what you feel like doing it. You have to talk to the business and see how often do they need their data backed up. You have to test restores to make sure that those the, the storage, the backups are sitting on, isn't somehow corrupted and all of your backups are bad. So have a process in place for checking that regularly. Um, there's always more than one option, always more than one option, and not every option is right for every situation. Again, be familiar with as many uh, ideas as you have. Um, And what I want you to do then, to put this into action. Um, if you don't already have a copy of SQL Server Express or even better, Developer Edition, go ahead and download it. Get the AdventureWorks 2012 database off of the CodePlex website. Uh, look for XVI32 and download it. Now you have a sandbox. Practice a point-in-time restore, right? Take some full backups, take some log backups, do some fun transactions. Practice restoring to specific points in time and see what happens with the things that happened before and after that point in time. Practice corrupting a page and finding the corruption and then restoring it. Uh, practice a piecemeal restore. You never know when you might need it. And then, if you have more questions, contact me my email address, my Twitter account, and my LinkedIn profile are here on the page. And yes, I've seen a few questions in the Q&A that ask, are the slides and demos available? Yes, absolutely. Please 
download them from my blog on blogs.lessthan.com. I see that there are a few questions out there. Um, and it looks like Rob has entered a few of them. Um, one question I see, oh, that person has left, but a good question. If encryption is enabled on your database, could you still use the stop at mark and stop before mark options? Answer, absolutely. Encrypting your database, even with, with either uh, TDE or using in backup encryption, um, doesn't stop um, does not stop being able to use any of these options. Let's see what's another one. Uh, does a full backup of a corrupt database produce a corrupt backup? Yes. How would you identify a how would you identify corruption in a backup? Uh, you won't know until you restore it. And that's the that's the answer to that, Lance. There is the option to when you do a backup, you can do backup database and then put the with checksum option in it, and it will check your checksums, uh, much like reading the page did. Downside is with checksum um, you can add a lot of overhead to your backups. So test that option, but it could be one choice for you. Uh, Good question from Sandra. If I'm already taking backups and I start using log shipping, does the log shipping backups conflict with the ones taken by the backup process when I want to restore? Yes. You only have one transaction log backup chain. And if you have multiple processes taking log backups, especially to multiple locations, in order to restore that database, you would have to know where all of the files are and what sequence to restore them in. Typically, when I'm going to enable log shipping, I will stop any other log backup processes and then let SQL Server's log shipping handle it on its own. All right, there are a couple of other questions, Rob, but I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. So uh, Rob will be able to send those to me. I'll make sure that I get those answered via email. All right. Uh, thank you, Jess. It's been a great presentation. Thanks. Um, really, really glad you came today and gave it. Um, it, 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 it is recorded. I just want to stress a few things, uh, and we're going to put it on YouTube and put the links out, and I'm, I'm going to mail Jess the links. And uh, uh, I don't know what else to say, but thanks, for everyone, for coming today, and I'll make sure Jess gets the uh, questions. And uh, and um, uh, maybe i get Jess to come back uh, later in the year or next year and give another presentation if she doesn't mind. So I'd be happy. Oh, thank you. And um, if you're in Boston, go to the SQL Saturday, and you can meet Jess. So <laughs> please do. All righty. Well, everybody, have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming. I'm gonna uh, stop the session right now, and uh, uh, I hope to see y'all at the next session. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>